one brief paragraph mentioned a glass bottle being placed into the cavity below the stone. And at the time, five years ago, I thought, oh, that's a nice bit of interesting trivia for Lampton. But then last year, it dawned on me that it was coming up to the centenary. So I started delving into more old newspapers online to find out the backstory. So in 1915, Lampton had a population of around 4,000 people, which is about the same population as Lampton has today, actually. And it was a coal mining township uh, with its own council. And for those of you that don't know, the council building that was uh, used is just up there. We call it the library today, but that's Lampton's uh, original council buildings. At the outbreak of war in Europe, many countries introduced uh, conscription, but not in Australia. We were the only country that called for volunteers. And that's why honour rolls in Australia are special places of remembrance and they have the names listed out because those people wanted to go, they weren't conscripted. Messages announcing injuries and deaths started coming back to Lampton, hitting the community hard. The people decided to erect a permanent memorial to the men and a set of entrance gates was uh, proposed to the park. Count the Lampton Council agreed to the idea and the ladies, uh, the Lampton Ladies Committee turned their efforts to fundraising. War, of course, is tragic, but when you're doing fundraising, you have to be upbeat. So some of the things the ladies organised were Paddy's Markets, uh, children's bazaars, they held a sports day where the hurdles were made from pit props donated by the local colliery. There was uh, motorcycle events, uh, including one called Threading the Mace, which I think was riding a motorcycle in and out a slalom of, of bottles. And uh, another coal mine donated a load of coal as one of the prizes. Uh, there was a performance by a troupe from New Lampton called the Musical Mokes. They put on a, night call, uh, a show called A Night in Japan, and that was held in the Coronation Hall. And Lazotte's building over there is the Coronation Hall. That's where it was held. Uh, concerts, dances, and operetta, uh, gala days with dancing competitions, even a draft horse race where the horses had to pull one ton loads. And of course, like most of these things, a cooking competition where there is even a prize for the best jam sandwich. <laughs> so from time to time, uh, an old glass bottle may be found by accident buried in a wall or the foundations of the building. When I rang the Australian War Memorial and said, how do you go about digging up a 100 year old bottle? Uh, they said, well, we don't know because we've never heard of one. And uh, so they kind of fogged me off a little bit. Uh, I spoke to um, State Heritage and people in the RSL. I jumped on Facebook like a young person would do and looked at Anzac uh, Facebook groups. No one knew anything. So I was getting more and more confident that, that this was the only one around. And finally, a stonemason mason in Sydney who's restored over 50 monuments in New South Wales for, for the government said he had never heard or seen of one. So that was the icing on the cake for me. So it's with confidence that I can say this is the only known time capsule from World War I in Australia. Yay. This event and the new capsule burial would never have happened without the City of Newcastle councillors unanimously passing Councillor Rufo's notice of motion. It's the only time I've ever been into council to sit in the public gallery, and I'm pleased to report that when it was passed, councillors from right around uh, all sides of the table were giving me nods and smiles and winks and thumbs up, and, uh, and I felt really, really good. So thank you very much. Um, the, and the necess they provided us with the necessary funding and the staff, uh, the working party, and access to resources. So uh, thank you to the councillors uh, and the staff of Newcastle, uh, the City of Newcastle.
Uh, today is unique. Um, over the last three months, I've contacted descendants of people who were here 100 years ago, be they on the, uh, the gates themselves as named people, or if they were people in the, in the committee. So uh, we have descendants of the mayors, uh, George Hardy and Edward Charlton. I'm, at, I'm George Hardy's great, great nephew. Um, there we have the great, great granddaughter of the North of um, Thomas Crowdis, the founder of, of Lampton. Uh, we have the uh, great grandson of John Estelle, who laid the foundation stone. We have 23 descendants of Mary Otter here today. We have Vera Darling's uh, daughter as, uh, as here amongst us, and descendants of the 19 soldiers, uh, over 19 soldiers who are named on the pillars. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, if you're a descendant of anyone lay, uh, named here, or the committee, so if you're a descendant, put up your hand and give us a little wave. That's pretty good, thank you. That's, um, today is unique. A hundred years ago in the past, a bottle was buried here. Today in the present, we're looking at the contents and burying a new capsule. And it's going to be opened a hundred years into the future. So you are all part of something which spans 200 years of history. But thank you all very much for supporting me and co coming along today and have a great day. to lift this, get the gate off, lift the pillar up to get to the capsule underneath. That process was relatively easy. However, once removed, there was a plain concrete slab, no sign of a space where a capsule could sit. And we all said to Robert, you sure we've lifted the right one? You sure it's not this one here? Um, but thanks to the wonderful stonemason, Harry Delick, who's here today, he said, I'm going to start digging. So he started cutting the concrete down and down and down. And we were at the stage thinking, Robert, I think it's in this one here. And when suddenly he said, I've hit something. And he'd hit the glass stopper of a glass bottle that was sitting deeply inside this concrete. I don't believe this time capsule was ever meant to come out. I'd have to say that to you. It was immersed very deeply right in the middle of this concrete slab. However, we were then able to break out, through Harry's skill, break out uh, the concrete around the top of the glass bottle and eventually retrieve the contents. So what were the contents? First of all, they're all over there in the tent and they consist of one newspaper and four coins. Uh, I think that's part of the story that um, it was meant to be there forever. It was, it was a process of putting those bits in to mark the occasion. But the newspaper is really interesting. It is an August the 6th, 1914 copy of the, I must get the title right, the Newcastle Morning Herald and Miner's Advocate. Now, it is the date that war was announced. So in a sense, it bookends what we see behind us here. These memorial gates at the end of the war, and at the base of this column here is a very interesting word, it says, these men fought in the world's greatest war. You know, it was meant to be the war that ended all, all wars, and we know what happened subsequently. But this was the back end. And what's really interesting is, that the, is the wording on the Herald's uh, opening. So it says, Germany remains defiant. Here are the headlines. Troops enter Belgium. Enthusiasm in France. Russia frantic with delight. Isn't that an amazing comment? Uh, here was the beginning of the war. There were thoughts at time the war would be over by Christmas 1914, and yet here we now have behind us the result of the world's greatest war of 15% of, of Australians that went to fight uh, were killed, a half of those that, were fought, that went to fight were either wounded or taken prisoner, so 250,000 people out of a population of just over 4 million. And these, these gates, I think, are so important because bear in mind, with everything that's been said today, that Australia at the time could not afford to get across to the battlefields, to the Somme. Uh, in southern England, you could hear the guns of the Somme later in the war. This was where people would come and mark 
those people that have fought. No bo one body was brought back. So essentially no bodies were brought back. That was General Bridges brought back to Melbourne. Uh, actually, one other body was then brought back later and placed in the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in, in Canberra. So these places are incredibly important in terms of what they represent, in terms of grieving and memorialising of what this country did at such a uh, nascent part of its upbringing. So, um, returning to the paper, um, one other little thing about it, you will see it, and we've managed very slowly to relax it and roll it out, it's stank of smoke, which is quite interesting. I think it had been sitting in a smoky lounge for four years before it was put in here. Um, and um, uh, it was all wrapped up in a roll, and there was a little cutout in it. And through going to the National Library's wonderful bibliographic index called Trove, um, we were able to work out what had been cut out. It's not very important, but it's just interesting. I'll read it to you. What was cut out was Royal Australian Naval Reserve M and O adults. All members of the Royal Australian Naval Reserve's M and O adults uh, are hereby read, uh, called by proclamation to muster at the Naval Depot, East Newcastle, before 6 p.m. with all uniforms, accoutrements, and at least two brackets two blankets. FHC Brownlow Captain RAN District Naval Officer Newcastle. So again, what's the story behind that? Why was that cut out of the newspaper? How, how did it relate? So and then finally, there are four coins. They're interesting as well. So they are a, um, a late Victorian penny and a late Victorian farthing, a one cent US coin, and most interestingly, a silver fourpence. Now, when we were cleaning it, my staff came to me and said, We've, it's a fourpence. I said, no, fourpences don't exist. You had farthing, halfpenny, penny, tuppenny, sixpence, threepence, sixpence, not fourpence. But it is a fourpence. It says very clearly fourpence. And it is, in fact, a groat, a G-R-O-A-T, a really interesting, very ancient coin. goes back to Edward I that was in circulation through to 1888. It is a silver groat. And the overgrowths that now exist are in the Queen's Maundy money, which she hands out on Maundy Thursday each year. So again, a really interesting part of what we have here. So that's, that's what was in there. It's now over there, and we're about to plant, so excitingly, the next 100 years in front of us. And now, in, to discuss that process, I want to, to hand over to my friend and colleague, Julie Baird, the uh, director of the Newcastle Regional Museum. It seems a little bit odd, perhaps, for some people. So I have the contents of the new time capsule. And I guess from a historian's point of view, I want to find out in 100 years time what people are going to think of Newcastle, because that's, that's my job. The list, in comparison to the four coins and the newspaper, is a double-sided sheet of paper of all the things going into this beautifully elaborate uh, time capsule. And I actually said, I don't have to read these all, do I? Um, so I've been told I'm allowed to uh, bunch up. The things that I, as a museum director, would be fascinated by in a hundred years' time are the newspapers. So in the time capsule, there's a newspaper from October 18th, 2018, that's going in. So in a hundred years' time, people can go through the newspaper and find out what's going on, plus a full uh, set of local newspapers. And that kind of stuff for me is just heaven. The other thing that I think is really great is that there are menus from Lambton cafes, there are aerial photos of Lambton, there's a real estate guide from 2018, and there's also a results guide. So from my personal point of view, the fact that you could sit and see uh, that smashed avo on toast was really popular in 2018 in Lambton, and how much it cost for a cappuccino, that's going to be historical gold and well worth the effort. The other thing is that there are programs and coins from today. So people will see how you all came out. They will see the photos, they'll see the running sheets, and they'll know that this was a significant event in Lambton in 2018. And there's also things like, there's letters from local members, state members, the governor. There's also a letter from the museum uh, where we say what we do for uh, commemoration of World War One, and I hope that they're still doing those kind of things a hundred years from now. There's photos in there, so there's school children in Lambton that in a hundred years time they're going to open up the time capsule and see your faces. And I was I was saying to 
Councillor Duncan, who are sitting beside us, said, what, what do you think the future's going to think when they open up and see all your faces? And um, I think that that will be really interesting because it's also things like what are people wearing? What do people think is important? Who knows? We might know, like no one might have glasses in a hundred years' time. You would have no idea. Um, the other really interesting thing is all the technology. So when I said to my staff, okay, if you were going to bury a time capsule, what would you put in there? What should I put in there from the museum? And the one woman said, my phone, because my whole life's on my phone. And I said, how's it going to charge in a hundred years' time? Um, what's the tech going to be like? So even from a museum perspective, something that's a hundred years old now, I can fix. We can soak coins, we can unroll newspapers. Computers in our collection and mobile phones in our collection are almost static objects because the technology changes so fast that what I think is like contemporary collecting, i.e. I've got a really cool Space Invaders game on a tape. I've shown it to university students who say, what on earth is this? What, what's, a, what's an eight track? So technology changes faster than other things. If you'd like to come and see the amazing work that um, Julian's team at ICS have done. I strongly recommend you go over to the tent, but don't touch. Uh, and those objects will go down to the museum and we'll put them on display on Monday so you can see them uh, and come back and bring other people who perhaps weren't here today. Thank you.